Good evening. <coughs> Sir, you set the okay, good. Hi, I'm Brian Saul. I'm the chair of the Howard's Board of Appeals. Welcome to the meeting of Howard's Board of Appeals on this date, December 27th. The purpose of this meeting is to hear and sign applications before the Board of Appeals, which have been brought pursuant to the bylaw of the Town of Howard and the Massachusetts Zoning <coughs> Enabling Act. As required by law, the town may audio or video record this meeting, which we are. Any person intending to either audio or video record this open session is required to inform the chair. During this meeting, the chair will recognize promptly a member of the board, secretary, and the attorneys presenting the case to inform the chair if a protocol is not being followed. While in open session, those wishing to present comments or ask questions regarding the case are required to fill out an information form on the podium. So when we have open session, if you want to speak regarding a particular case, uh, you go to that podium and there is a thing there for name and address to fill out, okay? Um, I'd like to have each, uh, each board member and including the secretary introduce themselves, starting with Rachel. I'm Rachel Lawrence, I'm the compliance officer. John August. Alexander Donahue. Brian Sullivan. Dave Ryer. Kenneth Dixon. Tim Bailey. Okay. The, uh, let me just pull up my meeting notes here. Uh, as a first order of business, I'd like to uh, feel that the order of the agenda, the benefit of all involved here tonight, uh, requests to be uh, adjusted. And I look, look for a board member to make a, a motion. Okay. Brian, I would make the motion that we uh, move the 481 Deeple Street, case number 2023-36 to the bottom of the agenda. Okay. And by that, we're going to hear... The third case to be heard. We're going to hear case 2023-38 for 38 Ocean Avenue first. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion approved. So, clerk, case if you number would call the first case. 2823-38, Nancy C. Hanlon, through her attorney, William Kroll. Oh, she owns the property located at 38 Ocean Avenue. Assessor's map, tick B, parcel H1-2 in the RH2 zoning district. The applicant seeks a height um, special permit or an alternative a variance 325 attachment 2. Area Regulation 325, Attachment 3, Height and Bulk Regulation to raise and replace pre-existing non-conforming single-family dwelling pursuant to the Howard Bylaws through 328.52-54 and Mass General Law 40A, Section 6 and 10. Um, Attorney Crow, did you get a copy of the a uh, butter's note, a uh, butter's email that came in regarding the case? Yes, uh, Ms. Lohr was kind enough to email that to me at okay. about All right. Excellent. 3 okay. o'clock this afternoon. The, um, the Board of Health indicates a project will require approval from the Board of Health at a monthly meeting if there is any increase in habitable space, habitable square footage or footprint. Uh, the Police Department indicated that they had no concerns, and the Northern Town uh, Departments uh, uh, have submitted input regarding this case. We did receive uh, an abutters uh, email um, regarding this case, and this is from Ken and Swan Miller of 12 Ocean Avenue. Uh, I think they're kind of down the street a little bit, and they just uh, just want to just read this in because I also may have questions regarding this, the Attorney Crow. I notice on the appeals application for the proposed demolition and build a residence for 38 Ocean Ave that the plans call for a full basement with full bath in the basement. Several years ago, my wife and I had our home lifted and wished to expand our basement space. We were told that due to the proximity of our septic system and that of our next door neighbor, we could not have a full basement and were severely limited in scope having us install a large five foot shelves and crawl space in a limited new basement. 
No habitable space allowed. Our lot is 40 <coughs> to 80 and almost three times the size of the lot for 38 ocean, ocean plans and neighborhood, neighborhood, and the neighborhood, neighboring and planned new septic systems are in much closer proximity. Have health guidelines changed that drastically? We support the demolition and plans for the rebuild, but curious as to the difference in enforcement of the health regulations from past years with plans for full basement, full bath and basement, and the full basement size. Thank you, Ken and Swan Miller, 12 Ocean Ave. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> sign voting for tonight on this case. Uh, I'm going to sign uh, Al Donahue, Dave Ryer. Timothy Bailey, John August, and Ken Dixon. And uh, Chairman asked the applicant to uh, represent, introduce themselves, and any person assisting in presenting the application. Thank you, Chair. Um, Attorney William Kroll from Howard's Port, and I have seated uh, with me Nancy Hanron, who is the owner of the property in question at um, 38 Ocean Ave, down in the campground, so to speak. Uh, we also have Dan Speakman here this evening, uh, the surveyor and uh, contractor. And uh, not here, but uh, is Tom Carloni of TPC Architects, but he's the des he designed the house plans. The petitioner is requesting a special permit this evening to demolish and replace the pre-existing non-conforming single-family dwelling as per the existing conditions plan and proposed conditions site plan by Mr. Speakman and the building and elevation plans by TPC Architects. If you follow along on the proposed site plan, the northerly setback will remain um, at 11.4, so it's non already non-conforming. The southerly setback will stay at 7.4. We know there's a bulkhead there um, on the plan that will be one and a half feet from the southerly lot line, but basically the house will remain the same at 7.4, which is also pre-existing non-conforming. The easterly setback from Ocean Avenue uh, will improve a little bit from 1.2 feet to 1.8 feet. I'm thinking that's like four or five inches. Um, and the westerly setback will remain at 2.3 feet. So it's a small lot. Um, the petitioner has already received approval from the Historic Commission because the house is over, um, just over 100 years old. Um, and basically we're building, we'll, we'll be building on the same footprint with the addition of a porch facing north. Uh, it shows on the existing site plan as uh, somewhat of a porch and an overhang, but we're, we want to make it into a, a, a full porch as you can see from the building plans. Um, and then the existing <coughs> screened porch that faces east on Ocean Avenue will become uh, full habitable space uh, upon uh, if you see fit to approve the, the uh, special permit. Uh, the building coverage is already non-conforming at 37.2%. There's a 30% max in that area, RH2. And it will increase somewhat, <coughs> not drastically, but about five percentage points um, due to the small area of the lot. And uh, similarly, this, similarly, the site coverage is pre-existing non-conforming at 40.2%, 35% is the max, and will increase slightly again, five to six percentage points um, uh, due to the small area of the lot. So we're here to request a special permit in accordance with the Gale findings of the Gale case to intensify existing nonconformities. Um, the porch facing north will increase slightly as I said on, uh, on as shown on the plans and the conversion of the screen porch to habitable space uh, will uh, 
create new habitable space within the 25 foot setback from Ocean Ave. Um, and the building coverage and site coverage will increase slightly, um, as I indicated, building coverage to 42% and site coverage to 46.7%. Uh, still not, in my opinion, uh, any, a, a drastic increase on, on either uh, of either one. Um, We have received the so-called denial letter from the building commissioner, Jack Mee, who says we have to come see you. Uh, as far as the Board of Health is concerned, um, this was a two-bedroom house, or is a two-bedroom house, and it will remain a two-bedroom house when the construction is completed. We're not adding any bedrooms. Um, we know that we have to go to the Board of Health um, and uh, receive their approval As the health agent, uh, Carrie Shona, says in her comments uh, that we have to come back to her if we're increasing um, her board, if we're increasing uh, square footage, um, anything of that nature. So we have every intention of going to the Board of Health and receiving their approval as well. As you know, that's their domain, not yours. Um, our our uh, mission tonight is historic. Uh, I'm sorry, is uh, zoning uh, compliance and not uh, health compliance, but we can't get our building permit, as you know, and, uh, without the Board of Health signing off. So we'll get whatever approval we need from them. Um, and as far as the, the comments from the abutter, um, I can't answer for prior health agents, uh, prior boards of health. Uh, every case is unique, as you know. Um, on its own, you look at it on its own merits. So I don't know why um, they didn't get a full basement, but we're asking the Board of Health for a full basement and a, and a bathroom in the basement. Uh, so our contention is that the uh, new dwelling will uh, not constitute um, or will not result in a substantial increase in noise, odors, fumes, traffic, congestion, or the like. It will not create a nuisance, and there will be no substantial detriment to the entire neighborhood uh, if this new dwelling is uh, constructed. And as Mr. Ryer has pointed out several times, it uh, seems that most of the um, matters before you result in an enhancement of property values rather than a detriment to property values. Um, so that's what we're, we're uh, looking for tonight is uh, a special permit from you in accordance with the Gale case to demolish and replace the pre-existing non-conforming dwelling. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to ask for the board for their comment or questions, starting with John. Um, I, I mean, I think... Um, you know, the house is certainly uh, in line with the neighborhood down there in the, the campground area, so um, I don't think there's anything extraordinary. Other than just on construction, you know, you only have two feet to the street and two feet to the back lot, and you're going with a full basement, so I'm assuming that there'll be substantial protection required for cave-in and, you know, uh, erosion control during the construction, and I think there's going to need to be some sort of limitation in the the time period because there's no place to, to park any equipment so it's going to have to be in the off season that's why we have uh, mr speakman here with his vast years of experience and, and in the campgrounds yep. done a lot of work down there <coughs> but i really don't have any questions in regards to the the proposed project no we've seen a number of these projects in the campground over the years and they're all non-conforming lots for the most part down there, and this one here is fairly consistent with what's come before the board previously. I have no, no questions. Uh, Tim? I agree with that. I'm looking consistent with the projects that have <coughs> been happening in that area. So Same shoehorn for each lot. Right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it is, and I you know, looked at the square footage. It's only about 121 feet greater than today. It's going to increase the property value of the neighborhood. It's not going to change the conditions. I would support it. On the uh, southerly side, there's a little 27 on it on your site plan. Is that a bulkhead or is that an outdoor shower? It's a bulkhead. 
Okay, where <coughs> is the outdoor shower run? It's not on the site plan. It's on the um, proposed site plan, the northwest corner, I believe. That little, uh, that little, that little right X's. here. That's oh, is that, okay, I thought yeah. that was just um, yeah, directional. Me, yeah. Okay. Those are the posts. <laughs> Got you. I thought that was just the architect showing, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, surveyor showing the directions there. I have no additional questions. Okay, um, one question just to just, again, just for my own um, learning here. Well, regarding that outside shower, when you have an outside shower, because it's just fencing that's around, you know, plumbing from the wall, do they get involved, does that get involved with setbacks? That's, I mean, to me, it's, a, it's like a fence on, the, on your property. So because you've got a fence, those outdoor, these outside showers have to be considered in setbacks. In my experience before this board, it's never come up as, as that I can recall um, right. I just just as, a, as, a, as an issue, just as with the Board of Health, I don't think um, those washing stations are considered um, That's what putting gray water here, right? into the water table either. And I'll call washing stations, not outside showers. Is that correct? That's what the that's Board of Health calls them. Right. Well, that's how the Board Everybody of Health looks at them. An so, outside they, shower, they, they, yeah. so they eliminated outdoor showers, now they're washing stations. Okay. So it really. But I believe because of gray water issues, that, that yep. it, it just says you folks have never gotten into that. That seems to be. Yeah, I just gray area, no pun intended. But, it's, um, it's like putting a fence a foot from your property line. I mean, it's it's to me, it's just I just kind of just is out of uh, curiosity. I just want to get a little discussion that. Well, I'm fine with the shower being there. Okay. Um, what is the time frame for construction? So, Mr. Speakman's company would be. Uh, doing the construction, so we have to have a septic permit, obviously, and we have to have this special permit from this board, so um, after tonight, and you've got 10 days, and then 20-day appeal period, so you usually figure 30 days from now, at the end of December, so February 1, a couple of weeks for uh, Rachel's department to issue the building permit, so you're probably somewhere talking in March. somewhere um, mid-February to end of February. Now, <clears throat> so we would hopefully have the shell up tight to the weather by July 1st. Looking at, and I, I want to look at the uh, side there with you have the uh, the proposed bulkhead. Mm -hmm. One one concern I have is all the trees that are on the abutters property they they're not on your they, they're not on your property i don't believe correct okay the one in the back corner the one in the, particularly the one in the back corner the bulkhead is buttoned right up to that tree i mean it's, and i went out you know it's my trusty uh you know tape measure but you're probably like within a foot of that tree right the neighbor and I are taking that corner tree down because it does have significant problems and it's got one good part of the tree that's okay. going on to the other neighbor behind us and she'd like it down too. So that's going to come out, that tree. That tree is other coming. Other trees are staying. Right, because I, once you put that foundation there, the root system is going to be. It's not going to make it. Right, it's not going to survive. It's already got enough issues as it is. I've okay. had a couple of arborists look at it. By agreement of all three. Property. That's what I want to check on. So that tree's coming out. Mm -hmm. Because okay, there's no way you can build that foundation on that bulkhead and do that without that tree being history in, in, in a handful of months. Okay, so I that agree. tree goes. Mm -hmm. All right, other than that, uh, the, uh, I don't have any other questions. Yes, go ahead, David. Just one comment. Uh, the outside showers, in my opinion, are subject to the setbacks, but they're covered by 
325.18G that if the structure's less than 100 feet and doesn't exceed 12 feet in height, they can go within five feet of the setback. And we've never had. Okay, so it can be within five feet of the setback. Yeah, because we've never had an outside shower, to my knowledge, where it exceeded 100 square feet. I mean, that would be pretty impressive. Okay, so there is, a, there are. <laughs> but it, there they are covered. I just want to make the point. They are covered. So a set they do have a setback requirement, but. That's in what, what is it? Which, it's 325.18G. 18G, okay. Same as the Cheds, really. Okay, excellent. Okay. And other small buildings. I guess the other comment I would make is the abutters really, if they want to know the answer to their questions, that is Mr. and Mrs. Miller, they really need to talk to the Board of Health, not the Board of Appeals. Uh, this is not within our authority <coughs> to uh, decide septic issues, basement issues. That's the Board of Health. I, yeah, I, I personally wanted to hear from, from our town historian on, on zoning as far as what what, if he had any 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 uh, recollection or any recommendations regarding how foundations are handled, so it's. Well, I would like to um, have the board uh, in the granting of the special permit mention that it's a full basement. Um, so the proposed structure with full basement and additional habitable space be created. Right, because. As we've seen with other cases, um, the setback is vertical as well as horizontal. And that's why when you have people finishing off their basement and they're creating habitable space in the basement and they're within the setback. I understand. Okay. But in, since you mentioned history, if you want one little thing. The, um, it dawned on me that last week, I said, you know, Maybe they don't realize how nice they have it here at, at the town hall now. When, when I started my, in 1978, the Board of Appeals met in the boiler room downstairs, no phone. For, uh, Dr. Roche was the chairperson, and they met in the boiler room, and when the boiler was on and hissing, you had to stop talking because you couldn't hear what anybody was saying. There was only room for one table, and the board members sat around the table, and the lawyers, you got to sit down if you were presenting your case, but otherwise you had to stand up around the brick wall. And it's still there, but it's come a long way, anyway. Well, we like you, so we're not going to require you to stand up during your okay, presentations, good. right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Chair Nell asks, or, do uh, any comments or questions from the public regarding this case? Does anyone want to step forward to? Okay. So you know what, I'll move to close the public hearing. No more. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Actually, more correctly, to close the public portion of the mm -hmm. hearing. Right. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the chair will now entertain discussion on the application by the board. I don't have anything further. No, nothing, nothing further. No, I think the case meets the requirements of the bylaw and the Gale case as presented by uh, Attorney Kroll in that it intensifies one or more nonconformity. It's not creating any new nonconformity and it will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structures. I do think we need our construction time re uh, restriction and our new general condition. Correct. Okay. And I'd like to now uh, entertain a motion. It starts here. And I'll read the second page over here first. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Case number 202338, Nancy C. Hanron, uh, has been granted a special permit uh, for 38 Ocean Ave Assessors Map. 6B parcel H1-2 in the R-2 zoning district. The, um, the property is, as I indicated, is 38 Ocean Ave. 
the proposed uh, structure and addition of habitable space, indicating we have a full basement, to be created will be an intensification of the pre-existing non-conforming and will not substantially be more detrimental to the neighborhood than the current structures because it will not create additional negative impacts with respect to traffic, noise, odor, and congestion. Granting is consistent with the Highway Zoning Bylaws of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A. Um, the, also the Gale and Diedrich cases and related cases as they may be uh, an intensification of one or more uh, existing nonconformities. No new nonconformity and no substantial detriment to the na entire neighborhood on a pre-existing nonconforming lot. The relief is not expressly granted hereunder. It is hereby denied all work shall be performed in accordance with the submitted, the application of said grant and the approval subject and conditions. During the life of the project, there'll be no demolition, exterior construction, nor new landscape between the date of June 30 and Labor Day of any year. A violation of the terms and conditions of this special permit may be enforced as a violation of the Howard Zoning Bylaw pursuant to MGL Chapter 48, Section 7, and a Howard Zoning Bylaw as they may be amended from time to time. The additional um, That's it. conditions, we have none. Yeah, no. Can I have a second for that motion? Any, or any further discussion of the board on the motion? Any issue with construction vehicles on the road for any period of time? I don't. I don't think they have room to park them all. They can't park them all. The road. So. I so. think that we're going to probably just have to go with our time frame. I prefer that, but I don't think there's enough room there. <coughs> so I don't believe the motion needs to be revised. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion is carried. Thank you. My pleasure. Congratulations. Congratulations with your project. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'd like to have the clerk read the next case. Case number 2023-39, Michael C. Fleming and Megan E. Munzberg, uh, trustees of the Fleming, Fe Fleming Family Irrevocable Trust. Through their attorney, William Kroll, they are the owners of the property located at 41 Zendler <coughs> Road, assesses map uh, 13 parcel Y9-1 in the RH2 zoning district. <coughs> the applicant seeks a special permit or any alternative from chapter 325-54-5 and also 6 to raise and replace a pre-existing non-conforming single-family dwelling pursuant to the Howard Zoning Bylaws 325-52 and 54 Mass General Laws 40A section 6 and 10. I uh, may indicate that there is a letter of support uh, for this project uh, from one of the neighbors. Yeah, that was from Ed and Carol Fleming. 
and he indicated that the two additional feet in the front of the house will not impact their property and plans for the home renovation will definitely enhance the neighborhood. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I've got one here from Walter and Judith Bosworth. Is it somebody named Fleming? That's the right letter, Bosworth. Bosworth. Not from Fleming. Oh, excuse me. I got, excuse me. I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, thank you. Bosworth. I wrote that wrong? Right. No, Fleming's are the petitioners. Yes. I, thank you. And one addition, if I may, to that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. That the Bosworths say that the Flemings have been great neighbors for over 20 years, and we will be very happy to have the Flemings living here full time. Excellent. Okay, voting on the case tonight. And uh, by the way, thank you for that correction, Ken. I wrote that down wrong. <coughs> uh, Al Donahue, Dave Ryer, Timothy Bailey, John August, and Kenneth Dixon. And I'd like to have the applicant represent introduce themselves and any person assisting them in that presentation. Thank you. Um, again, Attorney William Crowell from Howard's Court, and I'm representing the petitioners uh, who are the trustees of the Fleming Irrevocable uh, Family Trust. Um, underneath all of that, as beneficiaries, is Carol Fleming seated here with me um, and her husband, Ed his hand raised Hi, Ed. <clears throat> and uh, again uh, Dan Speakman is the surveyor and contractor uh, seated in the audience and Tom Carloni of TPC Architects is, is the architect I think you could take a stone or a baseball and throw it from this house over to the other house that you just heard so we've yes. got the same players um, in the same neighborhood. Uh, and we're also seeking the same type of relief. We want to demolish and replace the pre-existing non-conforming single family residence as per the existing conditions and proposed uh, conditions site plans by uh, Dan Speakman and the building and elevation plans by TPC Architecture and Planning. On uh, this plan, there are uh, some significant differences. Um, if you look at the northeasterly setback, which is presently nonconforming at 12.8, we're going a little bit closer um, to 11.2 to intensify that nonconformity. There is a bulkhead there also and relocated shed. Um, the easterly setback is presently non-conforming at 13.8. So you don't see this very often, you don't hear it from me very often, but we're going to make it conforming. So it's going from 13.8 to 20.9 for the rear setback. And this one has the outside shower labeled with the OS. Um, so that side, the easterly side, it, we're taking a chunk off the back side of the house and basically pushing it to the front side, as you'll see in a minute. So the backside comes off and becomes conforming uh, and getting rid of the patio and so forth for uh, site coverage issues. Uh, the southerly setback is 17.4 and will remain that. Uh, the westerly setback from Zilpha Road is non-conforming um, at 15.9, where you're supposed to be 25 feet. It will be reduced further. This is what we're looking for here to 7.9 to accommodate a three season porch. Um, now, Mrs. Fleming is going to retire soon. And she has, I will tell you, because she made it clear to me, she has her heart set on that three season porch on the front. Uh, it's very important to her. Um, so we point out that Zilpha Road, however, even though we're coming closer to Zilpha Road, it's a dead-end road at that point. It's the northerly end of Zilpha. Um, and directly across at the end of that road, the westerly side of the dead end, is the Bosworth House at 42. And so we're contending that it will, this will coming closer to the lot line of Zilpha Road 
will not impair the sight line because nobody's going that way. They were, nobody's turning onto that road. Nobody's going north, continuing north. And if you look at the plan, it shows, uh, Mr. Speakman shows the edge of the pavement. So we're 7.9 feet from the lot line, but we're probably double that or more from the actual edge of the pavement of where people are actually driving when they go on Zilpha Road. And the abutter most directly affected, the Bosworths has said, we have no issue with this. And no issue with the two foot uh, com coming closer to um, Zilpha Road. Uh, there will be no change in the number of bedrooms between the existing dwelling and the proposed dwelling. The existing building coverage is 21.3, so it's conforming. It's a 30% max. It will remain conforming at 29.8. As you know, with the Dedrick case, we cannot create a new nonconformity. We're not. The existing site coverage is nonconforming at 44%. Again, rarely seen. We're going down from 44%. 44% to 37.3% to make it less nonconforming, double negative. It's better to say make it more conforming. Um, so, in summary, since the new dwelling will, inc will, will create additional, additional habitable space within the 20 foot setback on the northerly side, because that side is getting somewhat wider, as you can see in comparing the two plans, uh, that northerly part of the dwelling, uh, the southerly, same thing. They're squaring off the south southwesterly side where it shows a patio. They're squaring that off. Um, and the westerly side is bumping out because of the three-season uh, three porch, uh, which is proposed addition and going from 15.9 to 7.9, so it's, it's coming out eight feet. Um, but we're not, we're remaining conforming on building coverage and we're reducing the non-conforming site coverage from 44% to 37.3%. So the relief we're seeking is for, is for creating additional habitable space within the 20-foot setbacks and the 25-foot setbacks on the road, on the northerly, southerly, and westerly sides. Our argument that is that um, even though those are intensification of existing nonconformities, that they meet the criteria of the Gale case in that there will be no substantial increase in noise, odors, fumes, congestion, traffic, or the like. They will not create a nuisance, and there will be no substantial detriment to the entire neighborhood. And ask that you grant the special permit uh, this evening. Thank you. In introducing the case, I don't know if y'all said it, but I think you mentioned it that the Board of Health indicated that the project would require approval from the Board of Health in a monthly meeting uh, because of the increase in habitable square footage or footprint, and the police had no concerns and no other town departments uh, submit any any input. I believe on this one we already have our septic permit. You do. Right? On, we have the septic permit? Yes. We yes. Do. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next up here, do we have any, I'd like to first ask board members for their input, starting Tim? Uh, yeah, I just have one question. Um, do you know the height of the structure? And if not, uh, if the cupola will like Will be compliance to that. I think it's like 35 feet. Or, um, have to check the site. I just see it doesn't mention the height. Uh, it does not. It does not. Okay. The All I can say is that we it, have to be yeah. in All compliance. Right. <laughs> um, we have okay, to be I see under it on, the 30 on a different feet. sheet. Yeah, it says yeah. under 30. Okay. Does it? Uh, yeah, on a different sheet. I was okay. On the application. Thanks. No. <clears throat> That's me on the application. <laughs> it's under 30 feet. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. I just, and it's about the setback to the westernly side, because the letter of support says it's going back two feet, but I think you've told me now with the three season porch, it's actually going back eight feet. I'm just, I'm just gonna make sure that the Boswell, Bosworths are aware that it's not a two foot addition, actually it's an eight foot closer to the road. We've talked to them. Yes, we've yes, shown them we've the they've been over the house. They've seen the plans. This says, this one, the letter says two. I understand that. And you're telling us eight. I can explain that if Mr. Mr. Fleming can explain that. 
Fleming, you're right ahead. I am at Fleming. When I had oh, can speak, to speak up, just go to the identify podium. Identify himself. Yeah, you yeah. Just identify yourself. And when I spoke with the Bosworths, I wasn't very specific. I didn't have measurements, and I said, we're going to move the porch out a couple, of, a couple of feet. I think they took that literally to two feet. Um, I didn't know at the time it was going to be six or eight, but we did show them the plans, um, all the drawings that you have, and um, that's when they wrote their letter of support. So I think their takeaway was just that it was a couple of feet. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. I'll defer any other questions. Did you uh, move the septic tank? It'll it's go in the backyard. It's not on the new plan. Where where does the septic go? Septic tank. The septic is going in the backyard. Where the, the patio volume. is. Where the patio is where in the, the backyard on the, on the existing conditions plan. Yeah, it doesn't show it. In the it plan. doesn't show it on that, but that's where it's being moved to. Yes. Okay. According to Mr. Speakman and Mrs. Fleming. And yep. that permit's been issued? Yes. Just wanted to make sure you got it back on the property because it looks like, <laughs> along with the walk, we, they both went. We put it on Ms. Hanron's property, the preceding uh, petitioner. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't know property it, it was. So no more patios, it looks like? No. Okay. I have no, no questions. John? Mine are more, I mean, I really, you know, I'll have the last one. I, I don't have a lot of uh, objections to it, but really sort of two curiosity questions, uh, maybe answered by the septic, is you really just seem to be shifting the building farther towards the street. Was there a motivation for that? Because you could have just shifted it back and you'd be in the same dimensions you are right now. My client wanted a three-season porch on the front of the building. So you just needed the room have the three seasons, but you, I'm saying, but you're shifting from the back lot as well, right? You're pushing from you're the back. You're creating more, yeah. You cut off. You cut off that small Structure on the, on the back, yeah. and pushing it out onto the front. Right. Yeah. So it's really just preference, not a, anything to do with the topography or issues with the septic or anything no. that related to that. Um, and then just having visited the, have you discussed the project at all with the neighbors to the north or the northeast? The ones that have the big trampoline right on your property line? Because I see <laughs> you're, a lot of the construction activity is going to be closer to their property line as well as you're moving the shed right over there. Um, just curious whether there's been a discussion. They've been the notified. Yeah. yeah. They didn't right. uh, express any objections. But jumping for joy. Jumping for joy over the property. On the trampoline. On the trampoline, yep. So, but those are my only questions. Well, I, I have no questions. <laughs> What's the expected time frame? Same time frame, uh, Mr. Speakman, for if we can get a permit. Same time frame as the previous one. Same crew walking back and forth between the two sites. It may not be the same crew, but a lot of the subcontractors will be the same. Okay. And regarding so mid mid February, end of February, to get the permit, start construction. Go on pause during the summer up inside and um, I realize it's dead end street and so forth and you only got one neighbor back there who's, but um, you know regarding maintaining vehicles on the on the lot during construction what's the anticipation they there? have they have the Zilfer Road area he, he's asking about whether you can put the construction vehicles on the on the property during well, construction will have some room yeah on on the lot Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to open up public meeting. Is there anyone who would like to speak and regarding this case? And apparently no not. one. I'll move to close the public portion of the uh, hearing. I second that. Vote on closing public motion, vote public Aye. hearing. Aye. 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 Favor? Okay. Okay, and I will, you know, chill entertain any additional discussion by the board. None. I think it meets the uh, requirements of the bylaw and the Gale case for all the same reasons we mentioned in the prior case. It's 
pretty uh, pretty similar. They're intensifying one or more existing nonconformity, creating no new nonconformity, and this will proposed project will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structure. I think we need once again need our time of construction uh, restriction and the new general condition. I would, I would agree. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Uh, the chair will now entertain a motion to close discussion. Case Hello. number. No, I don't. No, don't yet. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, no, well, we haven't. We haven't closed the. Uh, I move. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, just a comment with regard to the uh, the area down there. Once the um, lawn services start coming into that area. About the time your project starts, and make it very, very tight, and always is tight down there. So I think if you can try to get your own vehicles as close to that project as you can, otherwise you're not going to find a place to park. <coughs> All right, case number twenty twenty-three dash thirty-nine. Uh, Michael C. Fleming uh, and Megan E. Musburger, trustees for the Fleming irrevocable trust have been granted a special permit. Property is located at 41 Zilpha Road, Assessor's Map M13, parcel Y9-1 in the RH2 uh, zoning district. The applicant seeks a special permit or an alternative variance in 325-54, section six, excuse me, five and six, to raise and replace three existing non-conforming single-family dwelling pursuant to the Howard Zoning Bylaw of 325-54-52 and MGL, Mass General Law, uh, Chapter 48, Section 6 and 10. Yeah, it kind of duplicated. Uh, yeah, I know, it. that's okay. Yeah. The proposed structure and addition of habitable space uh, to be created will be an intensification of the pre-existing non-conforming and will not substantially be more detrimental to the neighborhood than the current structure because it will not be, uh, will not create any additional negative impacts with respect to traffic, noise, odors, and congestion. Granting is, is consistent with the Highway Zoning Bylaw 325, uh, Master Law, excuse me, 48 Gale, Diedrich, and related cases as they may be an intensification of one more Existing non non conforming non conformities, no new non conformity, and no substantial detriment to the neighbor the entire neighborhood. Uh, the pre existing non conforming lot. Uh, any relief not expressly granted here under is hereby denied. Um, there shall be uh, it, it, the all work will be done in accordance with the plan submitted with the application and the said grant and approval subject to the following conditions. During the life of the project, there shall be uh, no demolition, uh, exterior construction, nor new landscaping during the period of June 30 through Labor Day of any year. A violation of the terms and conditions of this special permit may be enforced as a violation of the Howard Zoning Bylaw, General Law 40A, Section 7, uh, and the Howard Zoning Bylaw as they may be amended from time to time. There's no additional. Yeah. Um, just clarification, we granted a special permit uh, and not a variance. Any additional discussion on the motion? Mm -hmm. I'll second the motion. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Motion has been granted. Thank, Thank you very much. Good Thank you. 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 Thank Crosby. 
just take a moment here, gentlemen. Um, before we start the next case, would anybody want a break at all? Because I think I just might take a quick one. Okay, so we're just going to... Just going to call up. So, probably a four minute break. Right back. On the clock. Case number 2023-36, <clears throat> David Crosby, uh, through his attorney, Benjamin E. Pronounce your last name, Paul? Just, just ignore the H, it's Zender. Zender. Thank you. Uh, 62 Route 6A, uh, Orleans, Massachusetts. The property is located at 481 Depot Street, Assessor's Map 36, uh, parallel B1, or parcel, excuse me, B1, in an IL and RR zoning district. <clears throat> the applicant seeks a special permit from 325-51Q, multifamily special permit, 325-54, uh, section 2, non-conforming structures and uses, 325, section 2, word uses and definitions of 325-8, ap uh, applicable to the use regulation of Table 1 and Table of Use Regulations. 
use of 30, uh, 39 self-storage. Uh, pursuant to the Highway Zoning Bylaws, 325.51 and Mass General Law 40A, Section 9. This case has been continued from the 29th of November. Okay. The, um, <coughs> as discussed uh, at the November 29th meeting, the chair requested opinions from the town council who has submitted two documents which will be made part of this public record. As these documents had already been shared with the applicant, everybody in the board for appeals, I will forego reading them at this time unless there's an objection from a board member, uh, the applicant, or any, any member of the public okay. attending this meeting, uh, this meeting this evening. And um, now I'm going to assign voting. The, um, Also, I'm proud of this public record, two of our board members, David Ryer and Al Donahue, who were not at the November 29th meeting, have completed the requirements of the Mullen rule, having signed the Mullen document, which was recorded with the town clerk. Uh, therefore, both can participate and be available to be assigned by the chair to vote in this meeting, as well as any subsequent meeting as necessary. Okay. The, uh, tonight on voting, um, the last meeting was myself, Brian Sullivan, uh, Timothy Bailey, John August, and Ken Dixon. Uh, Chris Murphy is not attending tonight. And um, with the Mullen rule, we're going to assign uh, David Ryer to be the uh, fifth voter on this meeting tonight. Thank okay. you, Chairman. The, um, I'll ask the applicant to introduce themselves. Now, what we're going to do at this point is we, we closed the public hearing before, so I'm going to make a, uh, a motion that we open the public hearing. And uh, I'm looking for a second on that. Second. Okay, <clears throat> second by Al. All those in favor in opening the public hearing? Aye. Aye. All those in favor? Okay. And uh, I'm happy to, uh, well, we're going to have a lot to discuss tonight, I believe, and I, I want to thank you for uh, you're agreeing to reassigning the, the agenda sure. tonight uh, for all benefit. And I think it also allow us to not feel pressured or whatever, but if we have other cases waiting, to be able to hear everything. And give, you a, give us all ample time tonight to discuss all the, the aspects of, of this case. More often than not, Mr. Chairman, I'm the one asking for a reorder of an agenda. So I'm, I, you know, I feel like you're a little bit of a sort of your sort and also this case lends itself to time and space okay so I, I thank you for making the request the uh so i think we could be happy you've obviously you've read the the opinions yeah. of the attorney uh we haven't yet as a board discussed it obviously which we will be doing that tonight but if you would like to uh, uh, kick could, things off maybe i could yeah maybe i could just sort of just give the big picture to the members again because it's a complicated case um my name is ben zender i'm here on behalf of david Crosby, who's right next to me who owns the property and is is proposing the project. Um, and as, as the members know, this is an unusual piece of property because part of the land is in the IL district and part of the land is in the RR district. And so, um, and the proposal is to have a multi, to, to turn a two family dwelling into a multi family dwelling, which is, which is in a historic building, which is in the <coughs> IL portion of the property, which is not an allowed use. Um, and that requires, and the multifamily uh, use requires a special permit from the planning board, which we've applied for. We've been in front of them one time. We're waiting to go back until we have, uh, we've been through the zoning process. Um, it's your town council's opinion that because the two family use is a non conforming use in the IL district, and the multifamily dwelling is also a non conforming use, it requires a use variance to make that change. And I understand the town council's opinion. Ultimately, it's up to your board to make the determination as to what relief we need. And I think we'll have that discussion in a few moments. Uh, additionally, um, a portion of this project, uh, will, uh, two of the storage buildings that David is proposing are in the RR portion of the, of the property, in which and, and storage is not a permitted use in the IL district. So, you know, our belief was that based on the reading of the bylaw, that you could, in a split lot situation, you could you could have the use in in, in the lot, provided that one portion of the lot allowed that use. 
your town council is of the opinion that um, that you can only use that portion of the lot that permits that use for the permitted use. Otherwise, a use variance is required from the board. So as I see this project right now, it, it you know at least based on town council's opinion, it's going to require at least two use variances: one for the multifamily dwelling in the IL district, and one for the uh, storage unit in the RR district. Um, town council also opined, if I read her opinion correctly, and, and the chair may disagree with me because it was a little unclear to me, that you meet the setback requirements for the district for the use that's in the district, meaning mm -hmm. we have to meet all our requirements in the RR district, we have to meet IL requirements in the IL district. And finally, town council opined that um, we have, we can only use that portion of the lot in the IL district, for example, for calculating the percentage of site coverage of that's in the IL district, and we can only use that portion of the RR district for calculating the percentage of the RR district. And based on those numbers that we come up with, that may well require dimensional variance if we do exceed a, a percentage of lot coverage in the IL district, for example, in the RR district. So uh, there are a number of forms of relief that town council has opined that we need. Um, we obviously don't want to go through the process of, of, of reapplying and coming back. Uh, so I always tell my clients that when you go to a zoning board, you really go to listen. Um, by the time we sit down at the table at the first hearing, the members already know the project, and we're here to listen to what your opinions of both the relief required and also of the project generally are. So um, if this board is going to determine that we're required to have variance of use variance and dimensional variance to receive the approval, um, we would like to have a fairly robust discussion tonight about how you view this application in light of the variance requirements so that we know whether or not it's really worth our time to go back and have the engineer redo this plan and redo this. Or the alternative for David would be to pick up that historic structure and move it over to the RR side, you know, you know, and then move the, the entire storage operation to the IL side, make it conforming, but then you're, you know, what are you gaining? You're moving, a, you're moving a historic building out of its historic place and you're moving it 200 feet from where it is now and you're costing David a lot more money and time and, and I don't think it really changes the nature of the, the project in the neighborhood. So that's sort of the 30,000 square foot view of the project and the application that I see right now. Um, so without getting into the nuts and bolts of uh, too much of the variance uh, application, I do know, and it's a discussion we had, or at least that I had with you at the last meeting, uh, your bylaw specifically provides in 32552 that you have the power to grant use variances. And, and I'm glad to see that because, you know, Mass Law is very clear. If the bylaw doesn't allow a use variance, the board doesn't have the authority to grant a use variance. But your bylaw also says that, you know, the use variance is granted pursuant to the terms of the statute, 48 section 10, which says that the hardship that's being established has to be related to or owing and related to either the soil condition, topography, or shape. Um, I don't think we have a, a topographical argument here, and I don't think we have a, 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 a soil condition argument here. but. Um, but it's, it's certainly an unusually shaped lot that was split down the middle by a zoning thing. So I think there's certainly something to talk about. But, you know, I, it, this doesn't work unless this board believes that we can, we can meaningfully and realistically achieve that hurdle. If you don't think that we can, we, I, we don't want to spend another X thousands of dollars to come back with a project that, you know, is going to be summarily dismissed. So that's sort of the practical presentation, I think, instead of the legal presentation. That's kind of where we are right now. And I want to thank the board for hearing it. And I want to thank you for your, um, for your work in getting the town council opinion to us, Mr. Sullivan. That was very helpful. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I'd like to be having an open discussion. And uh, also joining us tonight is, is Rachel War from our, with our zoning compliance officer. So, it, uh, it, uh, without any objection from any board members at any time during the discussion, if Rachel feels there's information you want to bring to the attention of the board. We will look forward to that. Okay. okay well, where well, to begin? Because I've got to, just to make sure we know what we're talking about. Um, when I tried to parse through town council's um, opinion, I came up with, you need a use variance for the two self-storage units on the RR portion of the property or are they built on IL? One problem I have, it's really hard to read your plan. It's I, the easiest it's thing, Mr. Fred, is just so the small. line. That, just see that line right there? Yeah, no, I see the line. But below that line is RR and everything above is, is IL. It's the numbers I'm having difficulty uh, yeah, with. Yeah, I have a large sorry. version, Dave, if you want. <laughs> How'd you get a large version? But you need a use, last time. A use variance <laughs> for the self-storage unit. Wait a minute. That's what it is. I'm sorry. 
Right. Uh, yeah, the, I, I tell Council Phoenix that we need a use variance to locate the self storage unit. And you need a use variance to convert to the two family. To a multi family, yeah. And because I can't read the numbers very well, I, I'm not sure about the dimensional variances. Well, and, and you need one or two. Do you need one for each zone? In fairness to the board, what, what we haven't done is it, because of the timing of getting the town council opinion and because we need to understand from this board the likelihood of, if there is a likelihood of the approval, we need to have the engineer go back and recalculate the numbers so that in, in, to, to comply with the town council's metric, which is what is the percentage of lot coverage in the IL district with the denominator being just the lot area in the IL district. And, and the same thing for the R. Those numbers, you won't find those in this chart. Right. Is it just lot coverage, though, or are you going to have well, setback issues, too? Uh, I think setback issues we can we can probably address. Okay. Because it's, you've got a lot of space between those two buildings. It seems to me if you have a setback issue, you can pull them together. Uh, I think we can address setback. I don't think it's yeah. a setback. I think it's the lot coverage. Particularly well, okay, well, the lot are. coverage, yeah, we'll have to see what the numbers are. And the numbers are on that. Yeah, they're up here. On the chart <coughs> for the that. IL and for the RR, yeah. What, yeah. We, what we don't have is, is if it were one contiguous lot. Right, which I think town council says Correct. is moot anyways, right? Uh, they, they need to be considered individually. And we are over on the, uh, I believe it's the IL district, we're over the percentage. Right. On the RR, we're over on the percentage number on the RR side, so we would require a dimensional variance to exceed that percentage number. Okay. So is that... They yeah, the, lot, the, the maximum is uh, the maximum is fifteen percent. We're at nineteen. Yes, it sounds like four variances. Yeah, yeah. If we break it down by the, the zones, All right? We need a use variance for the two self storage units. Right. A use variance for the uh, conversion to multifamily. Right. And then probably two dimensional variances. For site coverage. We think it's one. Only we, one? Think, we think the only dimensional variance is, is in the RR district where the maximum, maximum allowable building coverage is 19%, where we would be at 19.9%. We'd be 4.9% over the maximum on the RR side for building coverage. And the okay. site coverage would be significantly over. Yeah, about 21 Almost double. Yeah, 20, yeah 24 percent yeah. Mainly due to the asphalt paving. You're, you're needing site, site coverage. and building coverage. Yes. And then the conversation is, you know, is there other material which part, part of part of my thought process is what is there permeable material that doesn't come up r right as, as site coverage. I mean, I think, you know, just speaking candidly, it, it's, it's a difficult daunting task because if, if we're going to propose this and then have it plowed and then I switch material on the individual lot. It, it kind of makes that. Well, I don't think, again, maybe Rachel can comment, but I'm, if it was gravel, it still would not be considered permeable. What under current yeah, regulations, I'm just, and I'm not. I'm. I'm just saying there are. I know there are other. Yeah. Uh, you know, three three quarter of you know one and a quarter stone and so on, and there are other substances that could be used potentially for, yeah. for that. But the, the two well. dimensional variances would be site coverage and building coverage. Um, right, as as we as the plan sits right now. Yeah. Um. Do you want me to keep going or not? Oh, no, you're you're on a roll. Finish. You, you, we're going to stop at each person here. So. I've always had trouble, and I think I mentioned this the last time I came up with use variances because they don't fit Section 10. I mean, they just they don't. It's a use variance. It has nothing to do really with soil conditions, shape. It doesn't. But to me, the easier one, just trying to break it down, is the conversion to multifamily because we could, I think, stretch it a little bit and just say, okay, we do have a unique structure here. It's an existing structure that with little or no outside renovation, right, can be converted to multifamily. So I could support a use variance for that one. Uh, the storage units, I don't know. That's tougher because there's no existing structures there. They want to put them up. Um, I guess I'd like to see the, the numbers when you calculate site coverage and whatnot, but Personally, I'm just one member, but I'm, I would not say I would vote against it. I, I think we'd have to discuss it and talk about it. I would fully support a use variance for the conversion to multifamily. 
So that's just my opinion. Use, right. no, yeah. use, the law doesn't work for use variances. And no. I said this the last couple of meetings ago, we had one. I, f I forget what we were doing. And, um, where it, where it's, it just doesn't, but we have authority to grant them. So it's sort of a dichotomy. But since we have an existing structure, I think we could say the structure, yeah, it's we do have the shape of a structure and it's somewhat unique because they're not going to have to expand it to go to multifamily. They're going to reconfigure the interior. And normally our purview is the exterior, you know, not really the interior. So I, I could support a use variance for that part of it. The other part, I, I don't know. We'll have to take a look at the... Um, so, I, I, yeah. Storage units. I guess I, another thought was if you could make the numbers work, do it in one building. I, I don't know if that would work for you or not, you know? When you say one building, you should one building on the lot generally or we'll Yeah, if we could IL. somehow, you know, get one, you, even if it crossed the line, maybe we could take a look at aggregating it and whatever. One of, yeah, one of the things we've looked at, and, and I think this addresses the concern of, 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 of the neighbors on the hall to the south is to, to get rid of that smaller storage building down on the south side that's closer to the lot line and then just pick up that building area between the two buildings. And that would do exactly what Mr. Ryan is talking about. You know, you would, you would move that building away from the south side and eliminate it and then just fill in between the two buildings so that you could still get the building area that, that makes it work, but, but move that building away from the lot line, get rid of that okay. smaller storage. And that, that would also change, I, I looked at that earlier, that would also change the site coverage. And just to answer your question, Mr. Ryan, so the, 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 the numbers are on there. I know they're hard to read, but I can read them for you. If, if you look at the compliance table for the RR district, the site coverage proposed is 50% and the site co coverage required is 30%. So we're about 20, 24% over on the, the uh, site coverage for that. But on the IL use for site coverage, um, we are, we're proposing 56%, we're allowed 70, so we're under we're under by 14% on the IL side. Now, regarding the um, RR zone area for site coverage, uh, your plan shows 30%, but Rachel, if you correct me, Chick, um, didn't you find that the site coverage is actually 25%? Not, not 30. So that's in our um, area regulation. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then we're already, we're already over. I mean, and again, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, Rachel, in fairness, Rachel, um, we have not asked our engineer to go back and, and relook at these numbers. And sure. See if this is we just possible. want to let you know. Yeah, so if that's the case, if it's 25%, then at 25.7.5, we're already, we're already over that, which might kick that back into a special permit to intensify a non-conforming aspect of the thing. I'd have to look at, I'd have to look at that more fully, but... Yeah, that, uh, that might change that variance to a special permit. The RR zone area is 14.2, and um, that uh, that cuts it back to 30, to, with that 25 percent cuts it to 35.50. Again, we'll, we'll relook at those numbers based on you know, what we can out. We'll give you a, a better set of numbers to look at. But by re also by removing that that building that I've just kind of discussed, as well as that strip of asphalt. That's going to remove roughly, I count, about 2,300 square foot of site coverage and add back in 400 feet mathematically. So we're going to lose some percentage. We're still going to be over no matter what on that. On that. Yeah. And, and can I just ask a question? Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, for the RR zoning district, how we just went over that the maximum is 25%, and you say you're already over that, and yeah. that would be a special permit. My question is since that portion of the law is vacant, I'd have to ask. Him, I'd have to ask John O'Reilly how he calculated the site coverage in the RR district. But there's. But what I'm saying is, currently there's nothing there in the RR zoning district. There's a carport, right? Yeah, there's a there's there, yeah carport. Is there a carport? It's removable, but I don't know what. But yeah, that wouldn't. It's just temporary. It's not a permanent. He may be. He may be, he may be including uh, uh, 
ground improvements. I just don't, I'll have to ask him how he came up with that number ratio. I just don't know. Yeah, well, I think no. your concern is mm. if there's nothing there right. currently. Right, then you okay. wouldn't be over. Right, no, I understand. You're, you're absolutely right. I just, I just, you know, I, I'm relying on John when he says that the, he's saying the existing, he's saying the existing site coverage is 27.5. I just, I'd have to ask him how he came to that number. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I'm not concerned about that at all. I'm just, you know, had a question about your statement saying that it would be a special permit, but I don't know if it. Is there a driveway permit. through there? Parking it's, it's just parking I use it now for storage, pretty much. Machine, boats, trailers. Yeah, and if there's gravel down, the surveyor probably considered that as Potentially, yeah. site coverage. Well, if it is 27.5 existing, right. I think your point is correct. We could go with a special permit on dimensional, not need hmm. a dimensional variance. On that one aspect of it, on the, on the, on the on that one aspect. On site coverage in the RR, yes. Yeah. Right, because they're intensifying a pre-existing nonconformity. If in fact you've got twenty-seven and a half existing, right? Yep. Oh, and wait a minute. No, no, we've no. Been holding off of Mr. O'Reilly until we. No, it's not nonconforming because you're allowed thirty. Am I mistaken? No, no. The, the no, Rachel, we had the Rachel wrong. pointed we're out 25. the thirty is wrong. Thirty is wrong. It's twenty-five. 25. They made a mistake. Oh, okay. Property. I'm looking at the wrong table. table. So oh no, you're looking at you're looking at you're the correct right table. table. It, they're okay. They're mistake, right? Twenty five. Okay. Twenty five percent. Okay. I, I would say if, if if David's done, I kind of <laughs> it's a complicated case, but leaning you know essentially the same way. I I could get my head around you know the four bedroom the building's already there. You know the nature of that neighborhood. Doesn't seem to be a bridge too far, and even the the industrial use in an IL district, you know, not zoned for storage, but it's still an industrial district. I, I think my bigger issue would be what's in the RR district, um, and you know, not saying nothing, but some way to reduce the amount of impact within the RR would be a bridge less far, shall we say, <laughs> you know, from uh, you know right now. You know, uh, even now, if we corrected at 25, I mean, as proposed, it's over 100% what's allowed, you know, which seems to be a, a, a lot to grant, you know, under a, a, you know, either a special permit or a use permit. You know, if it was less of a, a variance required, it would be more palatable, I think. And I think it would probably be more conducive to the neighbors and the general neighborhood. Thank you. Tom. Um, with regard to the zoning, when I was down there, almost everything in that whole area was IL. Do you know when that was rezoned? I don't know. If I can find out. I, I'm just curious because we've gone from the RR zone. The IL zone and the RR zone, at some point, there was a decision made in zoning because it's directly across from Center Street and it's a short distance down to the Dennis Town line. So whenever they, whomever did it, I, I can't get my head around how we went from that because everything around it, from the Oyster building and everything else, is it was in IL. Well, and I mean, to the point the zoning stops someplace and he moves to the next zoning district. I mean, they're yeah, right I on know, the edge. But but it's, it's, it's a relatively small portion of land in light of the land and property around there. Yeah, and I think what the board's going to see when we, when we come back and pitch the variance in earnest is that it's really an unusual lot. I mean, when you look at the fact that this lot is just sitting right at the edge of the district and, it's, you know, it, it just, it, it, you're not going to see another situation like this, I don't think, very often at all. But... But with regard to when it was created, I again, my, I'm not a Harwich guy. I wish Bill Crow was still here. You may know, but I don't know, and I don't know how. So, so yeah, you know, okay. I mean, the, the, to that point, though, on the topography thing is does, and just hypothetically, does the fact that the zoning split a lot that pre-existed, does that create the topography impact that other properties in the area of the zoning district are not impacted by, which is what's required under the, to grant the. 
I've been. Um, I'm assuming the lot existed before the zoning. It's 1809. Probably, yeah. yeah. So it's the, it's the zoning split that created the divided position. Well, that's been me since. <clears throat> it's possible. We can go look. It's possible that topography drove the zoning. I just don't know that. And again, you know, everybody in this room knows this lot, and the halls know this land much, much better than, than I do yeah. before us. <coughs> possible. Um, Crosby, how long have you owned the uh, property? Uh, 16 years. Okay. So you originally had purchased it I, knowing I, the fact that it was a split lot. I bought. I, bought, I didn't understand fully because I didn't have this. I, I didn't have a site plan done for the first eight or ten years I was there. I fully bought this lot for two purposes: one, the historic nature of the home, because you can go look in JLC magazine. There's about ten articles of me rebuilding similar homes all through the Cape, which is something I adore and I love. Um, and the other reason was because I knew there was industrial commercial use of the property, and I fully intended at some point to utilize that use to the extent really wasn't sure. I didn't really start pursuing this until about four years ago. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, I began as well as uh, looking at other communities that how they handle split lot zoning. And uh, Typically, first of all, as uh, the attorney pointed out, the dimensionals depend upon the, the area that it's in. Also, they tend to look at, you know, only, only two communities I looked at. One was Chatham and the building inspectors commissioner uh, pulled up a case, uh, the zoning requirements for, for Walpole. Okay. But in general, on the split site scenario, the usage of the, the lot in the split zone uh, goes to towards the zone of the more restrictive zoning. And then it tends to look at what Portion, you know, looking at the percentages of whatever those that lot is. Now, obviously, in this case, there's a reasonable size for of the zoning in each each section, which could support its own structure with setbacks and so forth. It's not like it's you've got you know a little hundred feet in you know left in one zone and everything except a hundred feet in the other. Um, the uh, There's certainly, regarding hardship, other uses for that RR area. And so the, you know, the, I, don't see a, I don't see myself a hardship regarding why it would have to be, um, well, well, one viewpoint is showing what the hardship is, why it needs to be a storage building versus another residential type use which could also in that that district that section be be residential and multifamily so i'm kind of torn here as far as where is where is kind of like the hardship on, on, on the investment opportunity of the property you know it that can look at a lot of ways one hardship is the fact that constructing a storage building on that site is a fraction of the cost of constructing a multifamily so that, I mean, I just, I'm not trying to put your case for you, but I, I see the different things here. So I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, that you know, and, and I think we've had other cases, well, I, I mean, one other case in the last couple of years where we had a commercial operation that ended up going into a portion of it into a residential zoning area to satisfy the needs of what the major construction was in the commercial. And I think that's one reason why Mr. Raya might have mentioned if it was built and also was pushing into the residential, that was one way of looking at it that might be easier for the board to consider. 
Is my quote from that, David? You made that point? I don't remember. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> well, well, we'll play back the tape. Anyways, um, so on, that's my, as far as you view the whole thing, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the attorney corrected me regarding uh, the use setbacks. You know, there wasn't, we had another case in town yep. recently where, but because of the two, you know, there were two uses you know, on that, that site, but it was allowed uses on the site. And that's where she pointed out to me the fact that the dimensional, and as well as a, Rachel as a zoning compliance officer, uh, pointed out to me that it was, it should be based upon the dimensions of the res residential, even though you're putting an, uh, a commercial use on the property. So my comments last time on the setbacks were, we, you know, I asked, asked for opinion and received the fact that that in this case it didn't apply what my thinking was. It wasn't my opinion to give you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I agree with town council on that. I just, you know, I, I, I'm, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm the no. one person who can't tell you what the zoning board should say. You know, you have to listen to her. A um, couple, couple quick points. One is I think the standard for the variance is, is a hardship to the applicant, financial or otherwise, is what the language says. Right. So it's really, again, that's one of those facts that's completely in your wheelhouse to determine whether you think it's sufficient for the variance or not. Um, I, I think in this case, you know, to pick that house up and move it 200 feet over would be a substantial undertaking. And I'm not, and I, by the way, I do agree with other members here that have commented the fact of taking the, the current two family and, and converting it and allowing it a use variance for a multifamily. I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. And the other thing I'd like to point out is, is um, just one local code that I work with on a regular basis, the Orleans Zoning Code, says that where you have a split lot, then you can extend your use into the non-compliant part by special permit. So that's what Orleans says. They say that you can, you can get a special permit to extend into the, into the other part of the lot, which I think is a, a good solution. It still gets in front of a board. So, But those are my only two points on your comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would, if this was a building that was significantly in the I.O. portion and portions of it extended into the R.R., I believe that that would be um, easier to, you know, consider, you know, the, the, the variance or whatever might be required, okay? But um, we're now showing two buildings fully within the R.R. section, a standalone within there, uh, not extended into there because of, of a need to, you know, have a, to make the, to make the business work, have so many units available Understood. and extend in, okay? Anyways, that's just my thoughts on that. All right. Uh, I think, uh, any other questions of the board or comments? Is there anything that ha we need to go over? Uh, regarding the attorney's uh, response to my to my email, I have some comments. I'll let Tim go first. Yes, go ahead. Um, no, no, I don't have a question for the attorney. Uh, okay. I think our my hurdle with this is what we believe is a standard for a variance. The soil, the topography. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that the hardship here comes from the fact that. This is one lot that's zoned two different ways. I'll grant hardship on that all day long. I don't know why they did it, who, they, who did it, and when they did it, and I actually don't care. But to me, that meets, fulfills all the requirements for a hardship. But I understand that we have to go beyond just that's three different pieces. And David, you can help me with this. It's not just a hardship to the applicant, not caused by the applicant, which is qualified for, in my opinion, but isn't it also still about the soil and topography? Um, Yes, that's what the statute says. But my feeling is, if you look at a use variance, what does a use ever have to do with soil topography? Right. It just it doesn't fit. So if we go just by section ten, we could never grant a use variance, in my opinion, because you're never going to meet the requirements on a use. Mm -hmm. This really applies to dimensional variances. I would agree. And what do we do with use? Do we not ever grant anybody a use variance? I, I don't think that's the position we should take as a board. If I, I, might, I, I usually don't have a problem with the fact that you have to meet those three unless the town specifically writes in the bylaw that the board has the power to grant use variances. And 
And you know, I, I've learned about this from Brewster where you know, the board has in some cases said, look, we just can't help you. Um, <coughs> and, and which is unfortunate because I, I think the town people specifically voted at town meeting to give you the power to grant use variances. So I, I think you have to take that standard, the 4810 standard, and you have to try to soften that a little bit. That's what I'm saying. And, yeah. and so, I, so what we end up doing in, in you situations is trying to find, for lack of a better term, a good argument. And so you, you start looking very carefully at the property to see what is it about this property that's unusual. And, and what's unusual about this property is the split lot. The shape is unusual. The location in town is unusual. There's a lot of things about the property itself that are unusual, um, but the owing to or related to part of the 48 section of the town standard requires that you tie that hardship to that lot condition. And then it has to affect the lot specifically and not affect the zoning district as a whole. I think it's pretty clear that this situation we're talking about does affect the lot specifically as a whole. So every time I've been able to secure a use variance in various towns, and I think it's probably fewer than 10 in my career, um, it's always been because the board has been willing to work 4810 against their own bylaws. And, and, and I think Mr. Ryer hit it right on the head. And, and I think you also, Mr. Dixon, you hit it right on the head. So. But also, and, and maybe clarification, to me, I thought it was soil shape or topography. It doesn't have to be connected to all it's three. One of the three. Oh, just one. One of just the three. One yeah. of the three. Right. I, th I think what we need is, you know, not only the plan redone and hopefully bigger so we can see it. We'll, here, we'll give you full-size copies. I think we need, like, a memo of law from you stating your position as to why you meet the requirements, working through our bylaw in Section 10. And if you have any case law, that would be wonderful. But give us something that we can look at and chew on. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. If I might continue. Oh, yeah, absolutely can. No, no, that's I'm fine. Sorry. No, Dave, don't Mike appreciate apologize. it. No, it's all good. Going. Good conversation. Well, I just know that in the past, um, we've had uh, applicants ask for a straw poll and say what it, what would probably go through and what wouldn't. I think that's what we're hearing. Here. I think he's, they're, they're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just, doing it all night. I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking notes. Well, we, we do, but I... I think we've kind of the one thing that I think the board's going to struggle to get over with probably is that site coverage because it's it, to Darren John's point, you know, you're going from 20 if it's well, if you have 27.5, I guess it says it's required. If you're already in in ex excess of it, then we're not looking at a variance. We're probably looking at that special permit. Yes. But even then, the question would be, do you double the hunt over 100 percent more than what's normally allowed to be? But remember, the test is it's not based upon the percentage, but whether or not the new proposed structure is a substantial detriment to the neighborhood. It's not tied to doubling or tripling or, you know, 1%. Okay. It's what is the effect on the neighborhood? Is there a substantial detriment? Then we'd have to not grant it. If there's no <coughs> substantial detriment, then under the law, they would be entitled to it. But that's as, why I As proposed, this looks like every other property out there, except it's got a historical to give property us on it you know, facts and legal arguments. The whole, the whole way this project, no, it's, okay. I need them to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got them talking. I want them to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> the like other thing. Child comes home after dinner and they start telling you about their day. So the other thing that would be it, helpful is if, yeah. you know, when you're Thank doing you. it, if you could eliminate any dimensional uh, violations, that would be wonderful, we I can. think. And we can also reduce the we can also reduce the site coverage. Yeah, the uh, site coverage is. I'm sorry, did I no, cut you off no, again? No. Yes, no. <laughs> uh, my, my main concern is is more you know uh, uh, meeting the you know meeting um, uh, uh, building coverage is, is is my key key thing on uh, site coverage um, where. A lot of that has to do with the fact of, of having the, you know, the, um, the gravel or the tiling around the area. I mean, certainly there, um, you know, if, if any of the materials are, are um, previous, so forth, and, and though the bylaw says whether it's gravel or tar, it's the same, but certainly gravel you know, you know, has a 50% drainage 
capability, you know, versus tar. Okay, so it it certainly it it uh, something that I would look at you know, on a site plan because it you know it's you put down a patio with site coverage. Uh, you put down a patio with with blocks that have holes in it. It's it's getting drain it has drainage. Okay, and I think the coverage factor, I think it had to do with re, re, you know retention of water in your lot more so one reason, one reason why it's in there. And of course on the IL district, I think the site coverage is allowed to be 70%. Now, in my original thing to the attorney, I was trying to blend it and so forth. And, you know, how can you do these kind of things? Just trying to look at all different alternatives. But for me, I think the, the building coverage is, is the key thing. Um, site coverage can't be ridiculous, but um, you know, it needs to be reasonable. And, and then knowing what the materials are can help help sway as far as well. Yeah, it's over by five percent, but we can break down the materials. Here, here's what we're doing. Okay. The uh, so I think perhaps uh, if you want to ask for a few straw opinions, and no one else has anything more to say. I, I had just one more question, sure. more of a clarification, because I'm not sure. You know, there was a lot of, of, of stuff on the thing. The conversion of the existing dwelling. I got the impression from town council's feedback is that that's really um, planning board. It's us for use. Us for use. But we have to approve the use. They have to approve the structure. Is there so an order that that has to happen? Us first. Is it us first? Okay. Yeah. I mean, in my understanding, it's us first. So we have to grant the use first, and then the, plan then the, the planning board will then make a decision regarding the structure of going to multifamily. They have, they have to give us, they have, well, it's, it's, they, have to, they have to approve a special permit for multifamily use. Right. So. Yeah, we do the variance. You, you do the use variance and then they approve they do, the They do a special permit. Right. right. The other thing, um, just looking at the Massachusetts zoning manual, and they do have a section, looks like section 9.3, on mixed use neighborhoods, and there are a bunch of cases and they talk about where the residential district is not homogenous or the intrusion of business use is slight. Variances in, uh, for business use in residential zones have been upheld. Now these are just little sentences out of the cases. The cases might or might not actually say that, but I point you to that because <coughs> I'm not going to go through all of that. But No, it's very helpful. Thank you. I think you should take a look at that and if you find stuff that's useful present it one question i have on the board is back to mr august point here earlier is the the non-conformity pre-existing the zoning and that was something i i was wondering if there's more information on it what that looks like yeah i think my my point was that i i would consider that to be the the topography hardship that you have is that the, the zoning created an issue with the topography here on a, on a lot that already existed. Yeah, yeah but I have a note to look at that. Yeah, I don't I think it's just, I think they just drew, uh, drew an arbitrary line. I bet you it had nothing to do with topography. They just said this is IL and that's RR and just, and that's probably how most of the districts were created if you went back and looked at them. I don't know that, but I'm just guessing. They just drew lines in a map. Yeah, someone should have had a lot, you know. That's why we don't own Canada, because somebody <laughs> drew a line on that map. 2440 or five. Back in uh, uh, colonial days. But I think shape topography, the whole thing. I mean, it, it, you know, if this had been a whole lot in one or the other of the district, this would be a much simpler discussion. Oh, absolutely. The complication yes. is that it's been But I think here. that's what council is going to present us with. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So I, these, these comments are very, very helpful. Um, and I don't need a straw vote from the board um, because I, 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 I've taken pretty good notes on all of your positions. Uh, Mr. Bailey is a complete wild card at this point. <laughs> but the rest of you have, have told me, you know, what your concerns are and also what you're looking for. So I, I, I don't, I'm not going to try to pin you into a vote. This point it's your, your call. We, I mean, I'm happy to express my I, opinion I, tonight. I respect this board, and you know, I, if, if, if somebody comes up and throws a no at it, I kind of respect that as well. But to but become less of a wild card, I, I'm just kind of 
uh, confused and want to do like my own research on the splitting of the lot of uh, topography. Okay. What exact counts, counts as that? And just kind of do some research on that. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tim's our old card. <laughs> <laughs> I use the river card. He's always doing it on the left side. So I just no. I just I think I have a clear sense from the board about what your concerns are, and I think your concerns are exactly what my concerns were coming in, which is how do you how do you make a 4810 argument in this situation? Um, but also, more importantly, I wanted to get a sense from this board about what your concerns were about the project itself. I'm, I'm, and we're hearing them. We're hearing dimensional setbacks. We're hearing site coverage. We're hearing building coverage. Um, you know, a higher level of comfort with the conversion of a two-family multifamily. But, um, and then, you know, I think some of your suggestions about modification of the project are in line with discussions that I've had with David. So um, I just, I apologize for not coming in with something different today. It's just... Well, you, you, that means you got one more minute. Though. Yeah, I know the library's about to close. <laughs> okay, so, so thank you all. I mean, I know that I know there, I know there, there may be public comment. We'll, we'll look into that as well. So, but we will be asking for a continuation. <coughs> both of you. <laughs> Brian, did you hear that last part? They are going to be asking for. A we will be asking for a continuance, but I know that there are other people in the room that I think the halls may want to speak, and we'll we'll listen. Right. To no. The uh, yes, you can. We've already signed that document, so you can obviously the continuance can be. We can do a continuous the next meeting, but before we do that, I want to open it up to any, any other discussions from. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, is there any public comment that wants to be made regarding from in the Okay. All right. Yes, move sir. we close the public hearing. What? Oh, sure. Yep. Yes, sir. No. Alan. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Alan Hall, 473 Depot Street. Uh, just talk about the neighborhood. I've grown up there my whole life. My family's been on Depot Street forever. The zoning was put in place years ago, about 1969 to 1972. That area was zoned industrial because it was the train depot and the railroad tracks and ocean spray cranberries. A bunch of guys, one of them being my grandfather, was involved in it. James Marceline, Mr. Auer, Robert B. Auer, and a few others. That's when they zoned the town of Howage. They zoned North Howage in this corridor to help Mr. Hours' operation on Great Western Road. And they did um, Depot Street, where our property is, because that was where the train station was, and all the way up to Great Western. Then they did Queen Anne Road because the landfill was going there. It was being moved from Lothrop Avenue to Queen Anne Road. So they made that on corridor. And then they did Mr. Mossline's junkyard at that time for industrial. And a little portion up on Main Street by the North Howard Cemetery heading west. So that's how the evolution of the zoning happened. Uh, North Howard is always known as the industrial part of the town because of the Heron River, the cranberry bogs, the mills, and it just evolved from there. Mr. Crosby's lot has been there since the 1700s. Uh, the Gage family originally owned it. The split use of the property, I don't know that determination, why, what, how it all happened, but I think they used Center Street as a determination from the town of Dennis all the properties to the south of Mr. Crosby's property, including ours, are, are, are residential. And we, as I said before, we have 18 acres that abuts Mr. Crosby's property, and we have the same problem that he does. We have split use. So we may be before you for another application down the road. Um, so it's just in larger scales. So um, that's just some of the history on the zoning that I know from that part. Um, and then just a couple of things, Mr. Crosby and I have been in constant con uh, conversations over the last few weeks and talking about the screening and different things with the, uh, if this goes forward. And I suggested that we make a mound of sand three to four feet high, a berm where he wants to plant the trees and make them four to five foot Leland cypresses on top of that. That way there makes a nice living fence uh, facing our property. And then we talked about the operational hours. And in industrial use, the hours are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so I'll just put that out there. Um, the other fact is that we talked about, I think that's, I think we covered that. And then we talked about the, the building, which you guys have brought up, the two buildings in the residential area, the small 16 foot by, um, I forgot the dimensions, David, but the smaller one on the south side there. 12 by 17, and try to consume and put that in between the two buildings that he has proposed. Um, so that's up to you folks. And 
us as neighbors, like we said, we're not NIMBY guys, not in our backyards. We just want to make sure that we're covered for our future down the road as being neighbors adjacent to that. Uh, if I want to put a house next door, as I said earlier in the last discussion, and then just screening it appropriately and having business hours that conform. One question I had, I think some of the members, they talked about IL isn't zoned for storage. Did I hear that correctly or incorrectly? I think incorrectly. I believe it is zoned for storage. It is. Right, because that's, that's what I just want to make sure, because that's all it is, is storage and warehousing. So understood. Um, I think that's it, and we'll see what the next meeting brings along, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. I have shared some of those views, but also I have a few comments to some of the things being said, you know, about the neighborhood character over the last two meetings. Um, where we live and what we abut next to is the Cranberry Bog, and that is residential, rural residential, as well as everything south of um, Mr. Crosby's property and to the southwest going in the shape that I would more than agree that north of the, the property, um, his property and where his res uh, industrial area is, is all, as you know, industrial use, all the way to Great Western Road, and it keeps in character with that. But everything to Route 28 and to the sea, with the, with the exception of the businesses on Route 28, uh, for the two miles from the south of his property, including us, pass through on both sides of the neighborhood, is all residential. So. I do have a concern about, you know, the location of the buildings, the impact to us, the screening of those. I don't feel that um, there's some question, too, as to the, the heights of these buildings, because I see in the paperwork there's eight to nine foot height buildings um, proposed, but then in some discussions I've heard that they're 10 to 12. So how does a four foot screen screen it out? In other words, how do I function in my life in a residential neighborhood looking out my window or from my front yard or anywhere else and have it be, um, you know, the nice treed screen area that was there or is there and, you know, everybody's happy doing what they want to do but that I'm not looking or in being impacted by something that's being put in, you know, a half residential, a half industrial lot, but the residential portion ab abuts me. So if that makes any sense, I'm just trying to make a point that the character of the neighborhood, I would wholeheartedly agree, north of his house is all industrial as it is zoned. But everything south is residential and on both sides of the street, except for the southeast looking McNamara's, I think, but um, you know, it will impact my view and my house. Mm -hmm. And we've spent a lot of time and money there beautifying our future. So I just want to be sure that we're happy with whatever occurs here, too, as far as what we have to put up with and live with and look at. Ms. Hall, just, just for the record, would you just identify yourself since you were a speaker? Mora Hall, 473 Depot Street. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think you have to close the public portion of the hearing. I'll check. second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The, um, before we hear a, a motion for a continuance, any other additional discussion by the board? Okay. So at, uh, I will, uh, I can hear a motion to, uh, actually, no. Uh, Did you want to make a motion for continuance? I would ask the board to continue to whatever meeting you have, roughly, you know, 30 days out. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the continuance? Well, we have to make we the have motion. To make motion. Okay. Yeah, can't can't request. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll move I'll that. I'll second it to it. I'll move well, that case. Let's just sit over here, make the motion, we'll be all set. All right. 
I move that case number 2023-36, David Crosby, be continued as the first case on January 31st, 2024. At 6.30 p.m. Like that be in the minutes. Oh, 6.30 p.m. Yes, I missed that. Yes, that's right. Change the the six thirty. Thirty. Next year. Yeah. Can you change it yeah. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot that already. It's always the first one after you change. It's the hardest one to make. I'd second that motion. All those in favor of the continuance? Aye. 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 Okay. But, uh, I'd like you now to entertain a motion to close discussion. So moved. Okay, motion by John. Second. Second by Ken. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank All you right. for your Yep, thank you, you also. So at uh, the next meeting, you'll provide to the board new full size of plans and so forth, how things are going to go. We need additional copies. For yeah, full size plans, we'll submit full size plans. Um, I'll be submitting a memorandum. Hopefully before the meeting so we can oh, well, digest we, I, 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 yeah. I'm assuming I, I was going on a schedule at least seven days in advance. Does that work? I'm sorry, say that again. Seven days in advance of the meeting work for submission of materials. Yeah, are the plans going to be changed before then? or There will be new plans. Do, do we need him to reapply? Oh, yeah. Excuse oh. me. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's why the chief gets paid the big bucks. <laughs> we need to, uh, we'll we need to reapply. Yep. And so, um, and work out, I would, when you reapply, just in case there's any confusions, in every case, I would make it like, for instance, we talked about for the, it might be a special permit, but any alternative of variance. Yes. Use that language to cover yourself. So you may apply for a variance, and, the, and although the variance has a higher authority, you we'll see, that. we can do that, and you need to go and then an alternative of, you know, a special permit. But if you apply for a variance, we can, we can, we can approve a special permit when you apply for a variance, but we can't approve a variance when you apply for a special permit. So we may end up, you know, this, this meeting's been continued, this application has been continued to the third, we may, depending on Actually, what we file, what the advertising date is, yeah. we, may, we may ask for a further continuance to combine the new application that comes So what out. I was going to say is the filing deadline for the January meeting is actually tomorrow, so you, wait, so you're not going to make, make that deadline? So. Well, we'll get a, we'll get a plan and get it together. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They're not, gonna be, they're not going to be charged a fee for reapplying, right? Well, yeah, we. Um, I'll have to look into that, and I can I can let you know. But we, but we the board would like, would like to make a motion that we okay. we waive the fees. Okay. Yeah, I'll move that we waive the fee in this case. All those in favor? favor? Aye. Aye. Second. Aye. Second. Ken. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, because that's Aye. that wouldn't be fair to me. No, Aye. absolutely Aye. not. That's not what you work. We do anyway. Yeah. Waive Thank that you. fee. What's that? Only what we do is waive that fee. Yeah, we do. Although, wait a minute, is our raise dependent on it? <laughs> you know, I was gonna, I, again, I'm not sure if it's the appropriate time, but I know myself and, and a lot of people seem to like the full size plans, but do you know? I didn't, I didn't have the one. The application my says not to. No, I don't think so. The application says it's looking at the full size plan. Uh, we yeah. need to change the application. The application says 11 by 7. 11 by 7. 7. Yeah. They passed it out last night. Yeah, we should change that. One. I have a whole At least on the particular site plan. I got all that. That's Just on the plan. site plan. Yeah, that's all site plan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, what was, I didn't get. It was in my bundle. But I didn't. I didn't get a I full. Yeah. No, no, we got the little yeah. bitty. I have. I have a small one. I didn't get the big one. Yeah. But but I, having gone through the process myself, the instructions that come from the building department say that. 11 by 17. Just, yeah, just at least 11 by as, 17. Yeah, 11 no, because I looked that up In myself. In fact, it, there's a the warning that reason, says yeah. your application may be rejected if it's not 11 by 17. Mm -hmm. So well, we, get we might want to revise time. those instructions here. Everybody. You can have all that. <laughs> Oh, but that's all in the building. That's not the actual site plan. Yeah, I had this. Oh, site. yeah, this is, I don't care about the building. He may the have most important thing is the site plan. I wasn't here last time. you're back there. That's all the garbage back there. I should put it in my package. Is this garbage? Yeah, it is. Put it in my package. Yeah, I just. I went in there. Yeah, they they had already had all their yeah. packets together, so whatever they had in each packet, I just I just gave it I to the members. I guess I just got lucky. Yeah. 
But yeah, like I said, I know from going through the process that it says 11 by 17. Yeah. Right? If you guys want that changed, obviously you can do that and vote on it. I, I think we should make a motion to uh, amend our application instead of saying the original 11 copies, so on and so forth, the site plan where we say eight and a half by 11 or larger, we should say full size site plan. It was considered a full size site plan, though. I know. Well, the Jersey. And I had large one, but I don't know what that. This is a so this is a full size plan. Yeah. yeah, we should. I think we should require full it's size a plans. Size, but it's 36 by 24. I think is a full size. Plan. It, this isn't the first one, but this has more info than most. But mm -hmm. we've had a, several of them where the little plans are virtually unreadable. The, the dimensions. Well, because I think what happens is most of the builders are preparing full size plans, and then they go and they get them reduced. Right. Somewhere. And right. But I think we should change our application to require full size plans. We got the eight and a half by eleven. And it would only be one line to change. Yeah. Well, and while we're talking about this, mm -hmm. why, why with only what do we have? Seven members on the board. Why eleven copies? There's because they have to go to different departments, right? Um. Oh. Yeah, that might have been an older requirement when we were still doing paper copies for everything. How many members? Well, the full board is nine. Right, full that's what nine. I was gonna say. And then so we then would have extra copies. And there's two extra copies for filing no. size. Yeah. All right. We we could potentially end up with nine members on the well, board. It's actually twelve. With four alternatives, with four four alternates and five full members. Yeah. So or right you could have five, you could have ten, five and five. But right now it's it's nine. It's f it's it's five and four. Oh, that's been changed. I think it's five. I think it. I think our regulations oh, is it five, say and five, five and five. Five. I thought it was five. Okay. I think. All right. You may be from right. From the standpoint of killing trees, on packets like this, it says it's actually it's a twelve packets. Yeah, five and five. It's five one and five. original and eleven copies that the. Applicants I have I redid it. this a while ago, a couple of years ago, and the eleven goes back to ancient times, and I just kept it at eleven. Yeah. I assume because they wanted, you know, if you had a 10 person board and one for the secretary, or now when we have a complaint. Yeah, and I'm not handing out any extra copies to any of the departments. All of the information's online for them to, to so view. So what happens to? They, they end up getting away? thrown away, yeah. My guess is a fair amount of them get thrown away. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to make a motion that we amend our notice of appeal slash application and petition for public hearing to instead of eight and a half by 11 certified plot plans, we require full size certified plot plans and all the other information would stay the same there that we request beyond them. Just really the change of dimensions from eight and a half by eleven to full size. Well, we'll consider that motion on a new business, which I guess we, we can do that right now. So we'll, we'll just I'm going to rearrange the agenda. We're doing new business right now, and motion's been made that we uh, adjust the the application requirements for full size certified plot plans. All right, um, do we have a second? Second. Motion made by Dave. Second by John. Alternatively, to approve a high care plan for the board. Okay. Um, before I go back to approval minutes, is there, is whoa, whoa, whoa. We, we haven't voted on okay, it. I'm sorry. Or discussion on it. Uh, let's or have discussion. discussion. Excuse me. Yeah. Can we do it under new business? I know that we've had this conversation about open meeting well, laws. Well, we're going to tonight do it under new business. Right. We, we generally got to watch it. But okay. Any other further discussion before we vote on the motion? Okay. All those in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Motion approved. Uh, Rachel, that. you'll make the change, right? Yep, I'll do it. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I've got it on. If you have don't have it, I've got it on the word processor still the file. I think I think I have it. Okay. I'll if not, just let me know. You, but yeah. And, and I guess actually we'll make that requirement. Uh, you know, required going into effect for the February meeting for cases. For the February meeting. Okay. Is that all. And then I'm gonna. You know, we're just gonna. We can't push it for people for January. Oh, no, I don't care. Tomorrow. I just so, think going. Right, we're just going to do it for reasonable notice. Yeah, we'll no notice. problem. Okay. Someone comes in with smaller ones, we're not going to uh, 
because most of the cases don't require a lot of the detailed look that we did on this particular case. All right, first section of business is approval of minutes. And I would uh, make a motion to approve the minutes as published. I'll second that. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, approved. I, I abstained from that because uh, I wasn't here, so yes. I can't really comment on the minutes. Okay. Other than that one case I reviewed, which seemed to be fine. Okay, uh, under old business, we started uh, discussion last time regarding zoning regulations. And I'm just going to just pass out, you know, I had a meeting with uh, Rachel, um, with Jack, Jack uh, Me, the building commissioner, and uh, Christine, I can't her last name, Rachel, the planning director. Flip. Flynn? Flynn. Yeah. Christine okay. Flynn. Okay. So we had a little discussion at, um, which in part on, on uh, split lot zoning, there was one part of the discussion, as well as other things to look at regarding some, you know, zoning changes uh, and consideration of, of coming up for a town meeting for this next, next spring, right? And uh, one item we brought to the attention was I think it's on the CH2 zoning, but where, where multifamily is allowed and to allow also two-family, you know, uh, zoning, I mean, use anywhere where multifamily is allowed because multifamily is three or more. And uh, right <coughs> now, if it's a, you know, someone would be required to build a, a three or four family when they only want to do a two-family in some of the you know, zoning situations, particularly I think it's a CH2. Zone. Yep. Zage. So we discussed that, and I believe that the next step would be for the, the planning director to start developing that language to submit to the planning board and selectmen, and then go to the town meeting to make that change. So that's one discussion. Is there uh, any want to review that? Anybody have a problem or anything want to add to making those adjustments as far as the zoning on two families being allowed? <clears throat> the uh, other. Another item that we discussed, um, and there are, there are a lot of different, I mean, the town is talking about doing a lot of review of the, of the zoning requirements in town. So uh, I brought up at the meeting that at least there's a few that let's just get them in, simple, you know, not wait for the town to do a full zoning, you know, review of the town, okay? Uh, the other thing that I brought up to their attention was regarding site coverage, we had a discussion on pervious materials, you know, when you have block with holes in it, you know, gravel, and um, myself, Rachel, Jack, Kristen, Christine, uh, all felt that, that it was reasonable if you had pervious materials such as stone like that to then consider that the area that these pervious materials were covering to look at a 50% coverage factor. I think that that needs to be addressed. It's coming up more and more. Right. And that would allow for even residential and so forth to, um, you know, solve some of the problems and, and also to, you know, address parking on someone's lawn uh, site when they want to make it nicer rather than just park on your grass, want to put down gravel, little, you know, whatever it might be and Gravel's make for a nice, jealous. nicer parking area. Okay. So it, uh, that, that discussion came up during the meeting. And that's another item which uh, I think may go forward for this next town meeting and go for the process of planning board and selectmen and so forth. You know, a simple change is not going to, you know, really, I think, cause, I, I don't believe, a major objection at town meeting, all right? And so that language has to be drafted. Uh, then we had a discussion regarding split zone. And I just want to pass out the uh, so there were there were two uh, I'm going to go forward here. This is uh, just you have it. One of this is 
I think it's item I, lots in more than one district. This in this particular town, I think this was Chatham. Okay. I didn't should have marked it, but this was Chatham regarding what their zoning situation is. And this next one on split zones. Again, the split zone, the first one handed out is, is number is I. And the next item that came we discussed. Actually, we would, well, we, we generally viewed it in the meeting, but this happened. This one happened to come from, I believe, Walpole. So, the discussion was that the town probably needs to come up with, I and mean, we no one's, no one really knows. I mean, there's no. I don't have a concept. I mean, knowledge as to how many sites in town are split zone. But more than likely, this isn't the last one we're going to see at some point in town, and we need to have better directions, okay, going forward. So these are two towns. Uh, one thing I'd like to propose is the fact that we, uh, and I discussed during the meeting, that, you know, uh, perhaps if, if we're interested, in, I think it's a key for our, our particular board to get more better direction and to write have seen written for the town a, a, a you know proper language for for split zones. Would, uh, it, would it make sense before writing that to compile how many split zone yes, sites there are? Yes, thank. You. Well, okay. Well, first of all, in town, I I, we possibly could do that. I don't know how that clearly how there's going to be another case coming our way. Right. <laughs> uh, part, yeah. They so, bring the case we're so, currently dealing with. But right? the yes, and uh, I have no idea if there's two more in town, or there's 102. Couldn't couldn't possibly tell. Well, my my concern would be on some of these larger lots. E correct. The wording could get us in further trouble if we don't sort of in advance know what the lots look like that we're talking about. It, that's a, an absolute valid situation. So, but I thought if first of all we might. You know, start the research, and um, I'm just—I thought tonight I might ask for uh, volunteers from the board to also start to take a look at, dig up from the town uh, in the Cape, particularly other towns, and how they handle their split law zoning. Okay. Can I just make a comment? I'm yes. Not sure, yeah. we're not putting a cart before the horse. Here. Maybe. Go ahead. There's been a, uh, a lot of discussions with the governor of the state and the legislature going to revise the zoning for much of the communities within the state. Really? I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk with regard to affordable housing statewide. And as we all know, there's been some pushback. Uh, my understanding, as I've read the article, that it's looking, the governor's looking to uh, review all of zoning within the state. Uh, but we're t are we talking months or years? I have no idea. Okay. I, I, I can't. No idea. I, I think they're going to, I mean, the, the state has, has written other um, 40 laws. I mean, on, on Chapter 40, right, there's also 40R, which allows a town to, to um, come up with, with unique zoning in town. <coughs> To satisfy multifamily and and multi-purpose developments in, in town, to uh, actually to increase affordable housing, um, and uh, the, the, you know those are already available because of legislation from the state. Okay, so I'm not quite sure. I, again, I didn't wasn't aware of that. Um, the question here is: Is the board interested at this point? Just letting it. Laying low here regarding what's happening in split zoning and take each case as it comes along, or do we want to be a catalyst to start to look at what the impact is and what type of language we would want in a split in a split zone section of the of the, of the bylaw? And, and if I just may say Go something, ahead. absolutely. Um, in my discussions with Jack and the new town planner, um, adding something to the zoning code in regards to 
guidelines on how to address split zones is going to be on on the list that Christine is going to be providing the planning right. board to look at for zoning amendments because they we do want to add language to the zoning code to address that concern okay. and that's a that's a need from what the building commissioner wants to do and the planning director wants to do yeah okay and I guess uh, in all these zoning situations what they're doing I would like to see that our board is is part of that process well that's why I mean I I think the first step for me would be just how many are there Right. I mean, if, if we find out that these are very unique and there's only a dozen in town, I, I don't know, you know, how much the effort is worth, you know, outside of what, you know, the departments are going to do themselves. If there is 150 that might, you know, keep coming here and coming here, then it, it's a bigger effort, right, that yeah. has more impetus. And that's, to me, the first question is how many split lots are there in town? Yeah, do we have, how, do, how would we possibly yeah. find that out? In, four, um, in 14 it, years, we've had maybe four or five. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, it's annoying, but. I, I could get you a rough number just by looking at our zoning map and seeing with my own eyes how many lots are in split zones, but okay. that would just be me going through the lots on the map. Could you take a look at that for the next Yeah, I can, I can get a rough number. I don't know how accurate it, it would be, but I can. A rough number. I mean, I don't know. We're not worried about if you, you think it's 12 and there's actually 15. Yep. That isn't the issue. The issue is whether or not there's 12 or 112. Right. Right. And, you know, it's what, what is the size of the audience here? And I think the planning director would want to know that as well and, you know, for doing it. And I would think the planning director, Rachel, would want to see our attorney's opinion because at this point, I actually feel like we've got some pretty clear guidance on how we should address split zone. Yeah. And so I think. Let's make sure that those people are in the loop with what our town yeah. council has already provided us. Yeah. yeah. But here's, here, no, and I don't disagree with that. And we can certainly write, or help to write a, a zoning ordinance for a split zone that makes sense based upon, you know, our own interpretation, the, the, the council, town council's opinion, et cetera. One reason for doing it and having it, in my opinion, is when we're granting right now, let's say that you know any type of uh, a variance or a special permit, of having that applicant being better protected from having a you know the our decision being questioned in land court and, and, and the projects being held up for not only months but years. All right, you know we've seen that situation in a recent. In a recent, you know, decision we made for, you know, property in town, and it's it's gone to land court. Why? Because there wasn't specific language in our zoning code code that applied to that use, and we went by common sense and opinion from the attorney on how we ruled. But there can be more than one opinion. An opinion was made. It's it's it isn't it isn't the Bible. It isn't it isn't black and white. The person, the attorney, made an opinion based upon this information and what was basically she felt reasonable, based upon other aspects. So, I think when when something is put in code, the way we feel that it it works best for the town. It also, when people apply to do their projects, you know, uh, those decisions we might make if those projects do still require a use or a special permit or a variance, whatever it might be that they have better teeth if anybody objects to it goes to land court. Uh, well, I sort of or defers it to land court. Thing, what I was thinking is like if there was, and, and I might be doing the Pollyanna approach here, if there were only like a dozen lots in town. I, I realize that. Why not uh, just I, address the zoning of those lots and change the, change the zone and say, all right, if you're 75% in this zone, you're now 100% in this zone. And eliminate all future cases. Well, they may you not. You can't but, do that if there's a hundred. But, but each individual but, may not want yeah, that. Right. You know, if they may not want that. Otherwise, time. you're still going to have interpretation. Right. So you still need to add that language to the zoning code. And if the board decided they liked town council's opinion and wanted wanted that added to the zoning code, you could recommend that to the planning board. Correct. But we do need, at, at the end of the day, we still need language added yeah. to our zoning code dictating what to do with split lots. In, in my recommendations, we, we already know what the attorney said for our opinion. 
that we just back that up with also a look what else what's happening with the rest of the, the cave just to as a thought and just not making that thought out there the rest of the cave as what's going on you know and, and be able to you know dig those those codes up well if we write it with respect to your point it only will work in reducing the litigation risk if they squarely meet the requirements correct so i'm just looking at this first one here where they talk about split lot if you meet the requirements you get a special permit well the people that don't meet this are going to come in and ask for a variance so you're right back in the litigation exposure because they're not going to meet the requirements to get a special permit under the split lot provision but we may in, in, we may in fact you know put down the notes for us here's what we feel but what you need we to have do. four cases in 14 years it, why are we going to waste our time with it I, I hear what you're saying. I understand. And what town council opined was it's a court case, and that could change tomorrow with a new court case as far as how you handle split lots. That's true. Right. And I think her, her other point was is since we don't have any language dictating what to do with split lots, we can only make a decision based on the language that we do have, and that's how she came to the determination that each section of that lot has to follow the dimensional and use requirements for that zone that it's in. Right. No, I hear you saying. I mean, yeah, it, no, it, just we, we have. Elaborating. I guess I'm back in the day. I think it's like to me, if it's only a dozen lots, then I don't think it's. Yeah, and we effort. have maximum yeah. flexibility so, the way it is now. Yeah, if it's so let's looking at each case. Couple hundred lots, then. Well, maybe. if I heard Rachel right, there's going to be language, guys, whether we like it yeah. or not. Oh, that's so. Okay. The question is, how much effort are we going to put yeah. into it? Yeah. Change that, right. Right. I'm saying that all of the zoning changes have to come from planning. Correct. We only comment on what they've yeah. right, and, and I'm only suggesting. And if we if, they let us. if we don't want to pursue more research, that's fine. I'm only suggesting the fact that if we um, uh, want to take the opportunity to pursue more research, and, and John's also suggesting that we also take a look at, you know, what is the the audience out there, you know, the, the number of watts that that might be affected, right? And 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 based upon that number. It might even impact what, you know, the building, building department wants and the planning, to, planning uh, board wants to do about amending the zoning code for split lots. You know, it's a, uh, um, I mean, we, we, we had a split lot situation a couple of years ago with the, I think it was a mini golf course uh, situation. And, and, of course, at that time, that didn't, that was not a catalyst for discussion about assessing the zoning, okay? This case was right, and uh, so um, if the building department's going forward, I think maybe for the next meeting you can get that information. I don't know if you're going to be at the next meeting or not, Rachel. Mm -hmm. But at least, yeah, you know, I can try and get that you know, number get, for you. Get it, get it for me if you're not going to be here as well ahead of time. And uh, at that point, we can um, bring up again if we want to um, have the members here spend time researching other split lot split code split lot zoning regulations on the case uh, was there any oh actually all this that um, I do yes on the discussion of zoning regulations because Brian you and I talked about we we're going to be keeping a list as we came up with them yes that's been recommendations done. right for arbitrary number for flag lots remember that discussion where it's 22 and nobody knew where the number 22 came from. The lot number. Or the, that's a, the lot that, number. that should be brought up to be eliminated. Well, possibly. I'm not quite sure. We, we didn't discuss whether or not we want to eliminate it. But we wanted to have it. To, we want to pass that to zoning to come up with that and let us know that. Right. That's that, that's on that. What I've been doing here is also when we have these discussions, I sit down and talk to Jack. Jack's also keeping. They got that on there. Yes. How about the green? Um, Renumeration for 32554 because of all the ADU, the accessory dwelling units? That was already done. That passed by the town meeting. Right. ADU. So is our zoning, have our zoning laws changed to match it? Well, the, your copy, I don't think that it has. No, I has think that been. was, a, that was, a, that had to go in front of the, I don't know if that's been reviewed yet by the it, state. It did get approved by the Attorney General, um, right. and there are amendments that have been uploaded to the e-code on the website. If the members don't have the copies of the amendments, I can have copies for you at the next meeting. Okay. Because I had that, then I also had on uh, 325-14 T and G, 
which is other buildings, but it sounds like if we've made, if, it, if we pass that at the town meeting, yep. there's, a, there's a, a fresher copy for us to use for reference? Yes. So do the do members need copies of the amendments that have passed? I would like yes, to. Yes, that'd be fine. When that'd you say great. of the amendments versus a new hard copy? Yeah, you're going to get copies of the the new the new additional. The also I don't know what the status is. I, I didn't talk. To, I talked to the town clerk about this. Boy, I don't know, seven months ago, and um, they were looking at how to bring back up the, the full copies. You know, to to print them out again without also at the same time being able to print out the index and so forth. So, the town clerk was looking at having that availability i mean this is our bible we yeah, sit here at and, night and trying and to figure it out yeah so and ken the e-code like the whole code itself hasn't been updated all we have now is just amendments so it's right. going to be separate sections that you'll have to reference when you're looking through the code because the code itself has not been changed we just have the amendments that uh, have been approved yeah, the new amendments have not been put into the code right. itself, whatever. You know, it's just right. amendments. But we should get copies of the amendments. To yep, and I can provide those. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And do you your question, I don't think that's been changed, 325.54. Interesting. To comply with the Gale case. Right. I don't believe it's been changed. Oh, that particular section you that's have. That's a big deal. Right, no, that's, that's, we just keep going on that. That's, that is a big deal, and that has to, that has not been put in, uh, I mean, Jack's got the information about that, but no, that has not been put forth in the town meeting. Right. Yeah. Right now, but we it just. Should be. It should be. It if should that's be. how the board wants to I go been forward. About so. It for yeah. Three or four years. No, that. <laughs> or Jack has that copy. I didn't. I didn't push that forward the other day, as far as for this next town meeting. And so I would suggest for that one, if the board could put together some language to recommend to the planning board, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's. The, uh, I have a running list of which ones were rendered moot by the yep. Gale case. And <coughs> somewhere out there, there's a document that's already been written that says. Oh, well, the Gale okay. case was only decided in 2011. That's Don't why. <coughs> I haven't seen any of those. Hey, hey, hey. That's only 12 years. Come on. Yeah. It's 13 and now they're going to. Yeah, but somewhere, I, I could dig through my notes, but somewhere there was a document that basically said these sub. Paragraphs are moot based on the ruling of the Gale case. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. The. Oh, Brian did that. What I what I did what what did I do? Made the case is moot. You went through the paperwork on the. the yeah. Gale, uh, Gale case thing. I think yeah, I, I wrote that in there, the but the. Uh, uh, those problems of conflicts. The. Uh, I presented those to the, the selectmen a year ago, okay, that, that needed to be changed. And I also presented it to the planning board, the past director, Paul, and I presented it to, to, to Jack as uh -huh. far as uh, the sections there that, uh, under th that need, to be, need to be changed. And that was right after Dave had, had provided that, and I made, those, I, I made that information available to them. Oh, I know. I'm not doubting it. Just right, so. we've had a succession of planning directors, so it just falls by the wayside. So it was out there, but um, and at the time, uh, you know, basically they just said, "Well, when we revise the code, we'll get those in there." For right now, we just and what happens here is it's it, one reason why it needs to be changed because we know that those things don't apply, but still, you know, I. Even though that, like, we have a new building commissioner. Yeah, Jack's got to reject it. Jack because. looked at it, and he says, well, you know, they're over there. 25% change on habitable square footage, you know, for a uh, for non-conforming lot, so they can't do this. And I said, well, Jack, no, that's not the case. The Gale case comes in, and we're going to approve it. But because it's in there, mm -hmm. he kicks it to the board. When some of these cases, perhaps, it got changed, and it was actually changed, they wouldn't be keeping kicked to the board yeah. uh, in, that, in those particular cases. Okay, so point well taken. Um, do you remind me the fact of trying to talk to them again regarding maybe if they would consider getting in front of the town meeting this year? Perhaps I. I 
Yeah. Though I do think, I do think that that right now that language may kick up a lot. There's certain situations where some languages what we're trying to do is not going to cause or generate a lot of discussion. Uh, that particular one, uh, without having a whole new code go in front of the board, that one particularly might possibly kick up a lot of discussion at town meeting. Some of those changes. Just want to yeah. pull that to your attention. You know, so it's not as not as simple and perhaps it we need to have a time we discuss it with the planning with the planning board and, and have uh, the planning director review that with the planning board as well. Yeah. And I'd be happy to meet with the planning yeah. board to and go over that. Yeah, and again I'd I'd recommend if you can put together some language or point out specifics. I'll redo that. I did it to Paul. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll we do don't that again. I don't we'll, know what happened we'll, with that document. I don't have it. I don't think Jack has it. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. He. Yeah. Not. Too, not too sure about Jack. I. I. I gave him. The, I. I gave him the information. Okay. okay? Yeah. But regarding uh, the planning, the new, the new planning director, uh, no. And. Right. Uh, and I don't know whether or not Paul ever pursued that with the planning board. I had pursued it with a because the selectmen had me at a meeting and I gave the information to the selectmen at the meeting, as I recall. Okay. okay. So we we'll just have to redo that process. The only and it's it's sort of a broader thing, and I, it's not a specific task. But I think when, and I would I would suggest they do it at the end when they decide all the modifications that they want to make to the zoning code, they need to revisit the definitions and make sure that the definitions of specific items within the code now make sense. Because, like for example, the um, what do they call them? Not the frying pan lots, but the uh, pan panhandle lots. The panhandle yeah. lots you know, the definition in one area says they're now, they're now allowed, but then the definition says that you have to meet this lot number, which they're mutually exclusive yeah, we're safe for many of those lots. So right. it's like, but I would say that that has to come at the end is to say, when you reset all of these zoning, you know, regulations, make sure that the, the nomenclature and the definitions that are in the front now match now, and, in, and describe in, accurately. In, in some towns we got in shape factor, yeah. It's it's uh, both the, the 22 or the size of the lot, any portion of the lot, which isn't at least 30 feet wide, right. doesn't count towards the square footage of the lot. Yeah. When you look at the if the lot is you know 40,000 square feet, so if it was if it was 40,000 square feet, but 5,000 of it was under 10 under 30 feet in width, in some communities they don't count that that section as as far as meeting the the, the lot requirement. So these lots were all of a sudden you got a thin thing going out for, you know, for 40, 40 yards at, at five feet wide, right. you know, to to meet the code. They don't count that as part of the square footage. Yeah, the same so it's not it, like the multi-family, so, so, two-family housing is like that case we had like almost a year ago where that conflict came up. Is the, the code was modified in one area to allow multi-family housing. Right. But the definitions really weren't changed. Right, and that's on the so CH. That's a CH situation. Yeah, so it's like, uh, but so, anyways, it's yeah. it on the shape on the shape factor. Yeah. It's yeah. it. I think it actually has to be looked at a little bit whether or not, you know, to what extent, we're going to. Are you going to allow? Um, a substantial portion of the lot, or any portion of the lot that's under a certain width, to be part of the square footage and improve the lot. So it's not, it's not as simple as all of a sudden just dropping the shape factor, at least in my opinion. All right. It is, uh, anybody have any further discussions? Only I'm just curious. Who's on, on our board? I've seen there are six of us here tonight. Chris is still on the board. Correct. And Dave Nunnally could not make it tonight. Okay, but he's still on the board? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other discussion? Anything else? Okay. Well, it is uh, 929, and I will uh, call this meeting to adjourn. There's a motion. I'll well, second. I can make a motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. Second. All. Aye. 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 Okay.